never been a moment you are forgotten you are not hopeless though you have been broken your innocence stolen i hear you whisper underneath your breath i hear your SOS your
want to celebrate Jesus one more time in this place. Jesus, we thank you because you never fail. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you never fail. You are faithful. You are good. And today we come together to celebrate again your faithfulness, your goodness, your love. Oh, we love you, Jesus, tonight. We love you. We adore you. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody. Let us give Jesus a clap offering tonight. Jesus never fails. Amen. My name is Eddie. My wife and I have the pleasure of serving all the pastors as their pastoral team leaders here at Watoto. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this amazing commissioning service. Thank you. And a special welcome to our family joining us online. Thank you so much for taking off time and being with us tonight. Thank you. We love you so much. We love you. Now, amidst us tonight, we have people who have come from different places, different callings. And I would like to take a moment and mention a couple of people. All religious leaders have joined us today. You are welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. A special welcome to our General Superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of God, our denomination, Reverend Bishop Simon Peter M. Yao. You are somewhere right there. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming to be with us. We also have a delegation from the PAOC, all the way from Canada. Thank you so much for coming today. The PAOC is the mission organization that brought us our amazing founders, Gary and Marilyn Skinner, 39 years ago. Thank you for always being a help, a partner, and friend. Thank you so much. But also we have political leaders in this place. We have ministers, members of parliament. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you for serving God's people. Thank you. We also have marketplace leaders and CEOs. Thank you so much for coming again. Thank you. We love you. Thank you so much for serving God's people in the marketplace. You are making a big difference. But also, I would like to take this privilege of welcoming our Watoro family. Thank you so much for being amazing hosts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then lastly, there are people who have come from overseas, friends and partners of Watoro. We have the global teams. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you over there. CTC, the Hoskins, thank you so much for coming. We love you so much. Wow, we are so blessed because what God is doing here at Watoro is the result of friends and families in Uganda and all across the world. And we celebrate that. 39 years ago, our founders came to Uganda and planted this church, Potoro Church, that has impacted hundreds of thousands of people, including me. And today we are going to witness our founders passing on the leadership baton to our new leaders, pastors, Julius and Banita Rotlonio. It's amazing. What a day. What a moment in the history of Watoro Church, but I believe in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ in Uganda. Amazing. You see, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians 1, 6, that being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, in all of us, will carry it on to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus owns this church. He's the founder of this church. And he is committed to sustaining this church until his son comes back again. And I'm looking forward to that day. But today, let's take a moment and celebrate no other name but the name of Jesus. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, wherever you are, let's all rise up to our feet and celebrate King Jesus. Come on, put those hands together like this. Come on, come on. Give Jesus a shout of praise. All right, let's sing it out together. We sing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh. We sing. I'm not sick to battle. No doubt in my mind that my God is with me and victory is mine. I'll dance in the shadow. 
Come on, let us fill this room with worship. Will you lift up your hands to Jesus? Come on, just adore him in your own words. Hallelujah. Glory be to your name.
let's fill this room with worship. Lift up the name of Jesus. Come and lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Tell him, Lord, there is no one like you. No one is faithful like you. No one loves us like you do. No one is dependable and trustworthy like you. You are holy. You are righteous. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. your presence in this place no other name but the name of Jesus we worship you Jesus because you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords no one compares to you no one compares to you you are the creator you are the sustainer you are the savior you are the redeemer you are the deliverer you are provider you are the soon coming king you are supreme above everything you are the head of the church at the mention of your name every knee bows down every tongue confesses that you are Lord the glory of God the Father Jesus we celebrate no other name by the name Jesus oh we love you Jesus we love you we love you God wherever you are there is freedom there is victory there is joy in your presence oh God tonight we just want to experience who you are we are hungry for you Jesus we are thirsty for your presence because your presence makes all the difference nothing changes people's lives but your presence and so we love you tonight come on friends lift up your voice and just love on the king of kings and the lord of lords just tell him you know him. come on
Jesus. We love you. We adore you. We bow before you, Jesus. You alone are worthy of our worship. Only you, Jesus. No one else but you, Jesus. Because you are the one who emptied yourself and laid down your life for us while we were still sinners. And because you loved us first, today we want to let you know we love you back. We love you back. We love you back tonight. That is our response. That is our proper worship to say we love you. To live a life of worship. To live a life of praise and honor and adoration to your name. We love you back, Jesus, tonight. For who you are. We love you. We adore you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, and do pray, and everybody say the big amen. Amen. We might be seated wherever you are. Thank you so much. Wow, what an amazing moment of loving Jesus back for loving us with every part of his life. Amazing. This last week, our media team just put up a post on, I think it's Twitter. And they said, what are some of the best quotes you've heard from Pastors Gary and Marilyn Skinner? And there were very many. And very many. Some of them said that when Gary says he's the head, Marilyn says he, she is the neck that turns the head. <laughs> you know? And many others. But the number one quote is this. And if you are part of the Otoro family, you know this quote. But what I loved about this quote is one person just really tweaked it a little bit. They said, all of life. Hold on, hold on. All of life is a secret act of worship. And I'm thinking, man, that is cute. But not true, really was very funny. But you know the statement is, all of life is a sacred act of worship. All of life is a sacred act of worship. Everything we do in the marketplace, in the politics, everything, even when you go to the toilets, it's true. When you're eating that beautiful steak and it's just enjoyable, say, oh God, thank you for steak. It's amazing. All for your glory. Today, I would like us to put our hands together and welcome the man who coined that statement. All of life is a sacred act of worship. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all rise up and welcome Pastor Gary Skinner as he comes to the stage. Come on, everybody.
In hard times, you've been my friend. You stood by me to the end. When all others cease to be, I look around. You're there with me. Whenever I'm in trouble, oh Lord, you're there. Feel like dying, oh Lord, you can. Lord, you can. Always can. Always can. Whenever I call you, Lord, you answer. Always answer my plea. Hallelujah. beautiful wife to join me on the platform if she would.
love you too. <laughs> You're second best. Second best. What a good God we serve. What an amazing God we serve. Do you know what? In spite of everything we are, everything we've done, He loves us. He really loves us. He really loves us. He loves me. He loves you. you, you, you there, there's nothing you can do to stop him from loving you. Nothing. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you more than he already loves you. He just loves you. He loves me. He loves us so much. He came down. Jesus came down to the cross and he paid the price for our sins so that we could be free. There's nobody else like Jesus. You did pretty good, good for an old guy. guy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I, I've got to tell him just one thing before you do. All these people have been saying things on Facebook. Yeah. Um, here's, here's one I heard this week. Okay. Um, a, couple of, a couple of years ago, one of my grandsons was sent to call me for supper. So they said, old guy, old guy. And... My grandson's father heard him and said, come over here, come over here. Don't you ever call your grandfather old man. He's a distinguished gentleman. So now everywhere they go, I go, it's distinguished. They call me for supper. Distinguished gentleman. So this... Grandson comes to me this week, and he says, Papa, guess what? On Friday, you're no longer going to be the distinguished gentleman. You're going to be the extinguished gentleman. Come on, give a big clap for my grandson. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. And this is what it says. What a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him. I don't know about you, but I would be very unfortunate if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. You see, I'm just a simple Canadian pastor's daughter who's been married to this distinguished gentleman. It will be 50 years next year. Thank you. For That's a long time. Thank you. Thank you for not saying this extinguished gentleman. I'll never extinguish you. Thank you. But it was 40 years ago that God called Gary and I to Uganda. And I have to tell you, Uganda was not a place people were running to back then. It was a place everybody was running away from because it was so dangerous. And there were many times when I would have been very unfortunate if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and the power that stands behind the name of Jesus Christ. You know, God had told Gary, I want you to move to Kampala, Uganda. I want you to start an English-speaking church downtown in the heart of the city. And through that church, I'll touch the city. I'll touch the nation. We'd only been here a few months, and I had my first opportunity to see if God was really as great as what he is. Because a gang of thugs came to our house in the middle of the night, 25 of them tried to break down a simple wooden door that I could have broken down myself. They were banging it, shouting at me, telling me to open. They were going to rape me. They were going to kill me. They were going to kill my kids. I was petrified. I had only one thing on my mind. I cannot wait for the distinguished gentleman to get home. <laughs> because when he gets home, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And, and I, I had this scene played out in my mind. He was going to drive the car down the driveway, and he was going to roll the window down, and he was going to expect me to run up and give him a big kiss. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to go storming out with my hands on my hips, and I was going to say, Gary, what kind of a crazy man could bring a wife and three kids to a place like this? You need your head red. They have a place for you in Uganda. It's called Batabika. They have a nickname for you, Mulalu. But, but I, I heard, heard a voice. 
We've been singing praise and honor to that voice tonight, but that voice said, come on, girl, get up, get up, get up. I didn't bring you to Uganda to be paralyzed by fear. I brought you here on mission. And I had to make probably the most important choice I've ever made in my life. I had to choose, was my fear going to be stronger than my faith? Or was my faith going to be stronger than my fear? And, and for, for three, three hours, hours those, those men could, could not break down, down that simple wooden door. door. What, what a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him. <laughs> we started the church in the Imperial Hotel, the Crystal Suite. It wasn't Imperial, it wasn't Crystal, it wasn't Sweet. After a couple of years, we had outgrown the Imperial Hotel and God led us to this building. I'll, I'll never forget, forget walking in those doors for the first time. The roof leaked so badly that when it rained, you needed an umbrella to stay dry. The theater seats were all ripped and torn. The screen was ripped and torn. And as we walked through those doors, Gary cried out, Oh, God, what a waste of a beautiful building. And then he had a vision. He didn't see it the way it was. He saw it the way it is today. Renovated, full of light, the best part, people with their hands raised, praising and worshiping that name that is above every other name. And we knew this was the building we were supposed to have. But we had a little problem. Because the army was in this building, there was a civil war going on at the time. When they would catch the rebels, they would bring them to this building, they would torture them, even kill them inside this building. There was no way we were going to get this building. So we did the only thing we knew what to do. When, when you call, call on Jesus. Jesus. Some, some things? Some, some things, Julius? Julius? All, All things are, are possible. possible. So we prayed. We prayed. We prayed. We prayed. We prayed. Guess, Guess what? what? God, God didn't answer right, right away. The, the political, political situation, situation actually got, got worse. worse. One, One day, day the ambassador came to our house and he said, Mr. Skinner, Skinner I cannot, cannot tell you to leave Uganda. Uganda. But, but you, you need, need to seriously ask yourself, why are you here? He said, do you have machine guns and grenades in your house to guard you? He said, I've sent my family out. I've sent my staff out. Why are you here? And I was standing behind Gary. And I was saying, yes, Gary, God has sent a prophet to our home today. <laughs> you need to listen to the prophet called Mr. Ambassador. We got down on our knees and we prayed. And we said, God, if you want us to go, we will go. This was 1986, 1985. I didn't like God's answer. He said, no, I don't want you to go. I want you to stay. I want you to go and ask to use that building. And when you go in, you won't go out. So we came to the army. We asked the army if we could use the building for two weeks. We told them we'd clean it, we'd paint it. And I think the idea of free paint appealed to them. So they told us we could use the building for two weeks. We worked, we cleaned. Mrs. Nkanji, yeah. I honor you. The wife of the Minister of Finance came and helped us scrub this dilapidated building. I honor you this, say, this evening, Ruth, for being here. In the middle of special meetings, when people were being filled with the Holy Spirit, when many people who had never found freedom in Jesus we're coming and finding salvation that Jesus brings. <laughs> President Museveni marched into town with his soldiers. All of the soldiers that had literally fled were, told us to leave, threatened us, that made us afraid. All of those soldiers literally fled for their lives, leaving us in the building January 26, 27, 1986. And we have never left because God miraculously gave us this building. What a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him. And we've been singing about it. Nothing is too big for him. You know, all we thought we'd ever do is pastor this great church, and you are a great church. But when AIDS hit Uganda like a bomb, again, God spoke to Gary to look after children. I won't go into the details. You know the story. But we had the revelation about what really impressed God, and it wasn't how many people came to this church. But did we do something about the plight of those little boys and girls who had been orphaned as a result of AIDS? So we began to put them in families, and some of them were on the stage tonight leading worship. The backup team. 
playing bass, playing the instruments. What a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him. Can I be honest tonight? We're home. I'm mama, right, Brian? I'm mama. Hey, mama. Hey, where's Graham? His little boy told me last night I wasn't his grandmother. He said, you're not my family. You're white. I said, you go talk to your dad. He'll put you straight. <laughs> We're family. I didn't want to come to Uganda. I didn't. I did not want to come to Uganda. I argued with God. Have you ever done that? Hey, take it from a veteran. You can't argue with God and win. It doesn't work. And when it didn't work arguing with God, I started to negotiate with Gary. And that worked a little bit better. So this is what the negotiation went with. Like, Mayor, just come to Uganda with me, and when the church reaches a thousand people, I'll take you home. So I came to Uganda and I worked. Man, I worked. One day he comes to me, guess what, Mayor? There were a thousand people in church yesterday. I'm like, hallelujah, does that mean we go tomorrow? He goes, no, I changed my mind. Like, what? You can't change your mind. He said, when there's 5,000 people in church, then I'll take you home. Man, they thought I was working before. Sheila comes on the scene then. I was workaholic. Work, 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 work. Work, 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 work. Okay, my working wasn't necessarily because I love you so much. It was my negotiation. One day he comes to me and he says, Mayor, guess what? There were 5,000 people in church today. I'm like, Gary, British Airways now flies into Uganda. Can I go on Monday and book our tickets? He looked at me and he goes, no, I've changed my mind. I'm like, you're a man, you're not allowed to change your mind. Only I can change my mind. He goes, when there's 10,000 people, then I'll take you back to your mother. I learned a little secret between 5,000 and 10,000 people. There's trouble ahead when you think you've made it <laughs> because what you have is all you'll ever get. And had I not had that revelation, look what I would have missed. One day he comes to me and he says, Mayor, I'm a man of my word. There were 10,000 people in church yesterday. You can go book our tickets. And I said, I am home. We get to travel all over the world and, and share the story of Watoto, and I always give her a chance to, to start, and then I've got to follow up. <laughs> and I tell people all around the world, uh, dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> right, Julius? And I tell people, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. She's a dog, she's a real dog. No, no, don't be that. <laughs> and by the way, that person that wrote and uh, said that, uh, you know, I'm the head and she's the neck that turns the head, I, I tell her frequently, Marilyn, you can be boss until it matters. I have notes, but I know I'm not going to use them because I just want to talk to you tonight from my heart. As Marilyn and I stand before you today, our hearts are filled and overflowing. They are overflowing with joy, with thanksgiving, with compassion, and with hope. Our hearts are filled with joy we have joy because of what 
Jesus has done among us. Nothing makes me happier than what Jesus has done. We have joy because he has been faithful to us and he has done it. We have accomplished what he sent us to do. We have. And for that we have joy. But we also have joy because of you. You are the ones that we love and we long for. You are, as the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, our joy and our crown. You are. You are the ones that we love. You bring us. You bring us joy. We, ha we, 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 we have joy because we have run our race and we have reached this moment in, in our time and our history. And as we look back over 40 years of ministry among you, we can confidently say that this has been an amazing journey of faith and that our wonderful Savior, in spite of the difficulties and trials, has done far, far more than we could have ever imagined or dreamed. He's a good God. And we have great joy. But we also have a heart or hearts that are overflowing with thanksgiving. We are filled with gratitude because of what, again, the same thing, what God has done. We are full of thanks because we know that our labor, and we have labored, and our suffering, and we have suffered, for the gospel and for you and for the kingdom of heaven has not been in vain. We are filled with thanksgiving because of you, God's people. We are surrounded all the time by an, an ocean of faces. And each of those faces represents a story. A story of the miracle of new birth. A story of the amazing mercy and compassion and the love of God that so, so powerfully at work in us has transformed so many people. We are thankful because of you. And you know, this building looks pretty good. And the music and the worship is unbelievable. It's awesome. And there are campuses spread across the city and throughout the country and now in wonderfully up, even up in South Sudan. But the great miracle of Watoto is the people. The people. God's wonderful people, you. And you've seen some of them here, little b girls and boys budding like flowers. Teenagers opening up to the wonder and the potential of life. Young men and young women in so many different places of life and career and service and ministry. Vibrant young families growing and serving together in cells throughout the community. And then there are those precious distinguished gentlemen and ladies <laughs> who have been faithful. Yes. For so many years. Some of them came to me a little while back <clears throat> because I'd made a statement in this church. <laughs> You know what it is. All my pastors know. You know too? No, you don't know? You want to know, Levy? That's my other grandson. I'll tell you. This will always be a young people's church. Yeah. 
They said, what about us? I said, what Uganda needs are mums and dads and grandparents. Stay and be mums and dads and grandparents. And you have been faithful. And I am so proud of you. The statistics are, are there and they're not that important. The, the, the number of campuses, the number of communities where we have vulnerable children and women in the homes, the Watoto homes that have schools and clinics and sports facilities and worship, the immense number of marginalized women in our community who have been welcomed into the family of God and we as a church have embraced them and empowered them with life skills and we're engaging with them, with them. Thousands, thousands of them. You've seen some of their pictures. It's all about them. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about Julius. It's about Jesus and what he does in people. So I thank God for you. You are God's wonderful people. And I, I, I've, I've preached my heart out in this church. And one of the things that I've preached as being so critical is that we embrace the servant spirit of leadership. Because if God has called us to do anything, he's called us not just to rescue, but to raise leaders. And that's not the end, it's so that we can rebuild a nation. Because we have a dream that Africa does not have to stay the way it is. That God is looking for young people, little Moseses bought out of the bulrushes, like out of our babies' homes who will become great leaders. Little boys and girls who travel around the world and sing. And when they get a chance, they say, when I grow up, I want to be, and there's a dream placed in them because they want to build a new Africa. So we're here to rescue, but we're also here to raise so that we can rebuild a new Africa. <clears throat> and you have embraced that serving spirit. You have, and I am so proud of you. And the serving spirit is not just what you do here, but you're serving in the high places of politics as your act of worship to God, as a political servant. You're serving by meeting the needs of people through building a national economy of equity and justice and fairness. And you're fighting corruption. God bless you. You're serving together by educating the children so that together we can inherit a better future. You're serving by healing the bodies of the sick and the frail through the, modern, the marvel of modern medicine. You're serving in so many different places. That is God's call on your life as God's people to bring about transformation to the glory of God. That's what this church is all about. It's what it's all about. It's not about music. It's not about fine preaching. It's about transformed people transforming their community. You know that God's work is not what one man does behind a pulpit on Sunday, but what everybody does in the community every day. You know that all of life <clears throat> is a sacred gift from God and that all of life is a sacred act of worship. You know that. So I am thankful for you. Our greatest national treasure is not the oil we have discovered. It is not the national parks that are teeming with magnificent African animals. It's not the rivers, the lakes, the mountains, the rich and verdant plains. It's not our forests or even our cultural heritage that is our greatest treasure. 
Our greatest Ugandan treasure are her people. And I'm biased from here down to here. The best of the best go to church and serve God. Our greatest resource, our greatest asset rather, is Jesus. Himself, present, living in us, changing us into his image again. Our greatest resource is the Bible, the Word of God. Nothing can change people like God's Word, revealing God's Son. And of all of our people, our greatest resource are our children. It's not a mistake that we are called. Watoto. Marilyn and I have not been here just to build a church. Although we are building a church and a church is what's needed, we are here to build much more a living people. That is the real church. Church is not an event you go to. Church is a family that you belong to. We are here to watch those children grow and mature and to pour our resources into them so that they can become a mighty forest. We are overflowing with joy because of what Jesus has done, because of you, thanksgiving because of Jesus and because of you. But I am overflowing with thanksgiving today because of who you are and what you do. I want to take some time to thank people. It's always dangerous because you're going to forget somebody. <laughs> and there are so many to thank. All the people who do, I want to start with all the people who do seemingly insignificant mundane things around here. The administrative teams. The, the, the security and the maintenance and the, clean, the, the, the cleaners. I, I know that they, 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 I stop and I thank them because they are VIPs. The young man who doesn't get to go to church until later because he's parking cars. When I drove in today, there was a young man at the gate in his uniform. His name is Kenyi. I thought you probably wouldn't know him, but you've seen him around here for a hundred years cleaning this church. Kenyi, you are a superstar. You are. You're a superstar. I want to thank the elders of this church. I do. They care for us as pastors, and boy, they do a good job. And they love us, and they hold us accountable, and they care for our well-being. And I want you to know that they put together a, a retirement package for me. They did. They did. We're not going to starve, sweetheart. 
You know what that is? Honor. That's real honor. The deacons, those that serve in so many ways to, to make sure that not one shilling is misspent. Yep. And they make up with some of our pastors, some of them are our leadership team, our church council. And you know, I'm a strong leader and I know where I've been going, but I have had the most amazing team of people in a, in, in a board, in, a guy, guys and gals. Thank you. I thank you. One of the things that God made plain to us is that we are not just to rescue a child or a, a, a person who needs Christ, but we are to raise them to be a leader so that they can, re, together we can rebuild a nation. One of the amazing things that happened was God told us that we, were, we needed to start looking after, or rather we needed to become a small group church. And I, maybe you've heard the story, maybe you haven't. I was talking to God and, and, and I, you know, I just was thanking him for the honor of serving him. And he said, who do you think you are anyway? And I said, I don't understand. He said, I said, who do you think you are anyway? I said, I, I don't understand. He said, you think you pastor these thousands of people? I said, I do. And then he said something that changed my life. He said, nobody can pastor more than 10 people. Even my son, Jesus, only pastored 12. Who do you think you are? And we, he said, I knew we were to be a small group church. We began, we transformed our church from a program-based church to a cell-based church. I didn't understand everything that God was doing, but one of the things was to raise leaders out of ordinary people. And over the last number of years, we've grown so that we have about 2,500 cells in this church, which means we have about 2,500 leaders. And every five cells is a section, so you have a section leader. And every five cell sections is a zone, zones and regions and districts and so on, which means that and every leader is to find another leader to mentor to take over when the cell multiplies. So actually, we have 6,000 leaders. And our dream, God's dream was so that we would, as he began to reveal to us that all of life is sacred and that everything in our community is owned by him and that what you do is your sacred act of worship to him. It was about raising leaders to go into all of the different spheres of life. And I have watched with amazement as ordinary Ugandans have emerged into leadership. And I want to stand up here today. I'm not here to preach a sermon. I'm here to, from my heart, say to you, I love you. I am so proud of you. Cell leaders, what you do every week is amazing. Amazing. Every week, week after week, following up those that come to Christ, pastoring a small group of people, teaching them, leading them into their spiritual gifts, prayer walking the community, finding the situations and the needs in your community, being the point of the spear in the community. It's a revelation. All of this was from God. And then God said, I want you to ask the cells to find a poor Muslim family and just love them. And, I, and then I, God said, I want you to ask the cells to find a, a, a marginalized, vulnerable woman who's raising her, who's probably HIV positive and struggling to, for, to, to raise her children and just love them. And out of that grew Watoto neighborhood so that we are reaching now about, I don't know, 6,000 women in our communities by training them and teaching them that they are not garbage 
but they're precious and they're made in the image of God. And whether you're a clean or a dirty 10,000 shilling note, it's just the same. And you may feel dirty, but Jesus sees your value and your worth. And we've watched these women rise. And as, as I shared that with Sales, they began to do it. I remember going with Pastor Franco to our southern campus and we had, we had to eat something after the service. And there was a line serving food. And Franco leaned over to me and he said, Gary, do you see this lady that's serving the food? I said, yep. He said, can I tell you her story? He said, when you told the cells that they were to find a poor Muslim family, maybe an HIV positive woman who is struggling, one of our cell leaders in this re district went and she to her cell, she said, Pastor Gary's told so. They knew immediately, there's this lady that lives down the street here. They went to, as a cell to her home. They knocked on the little wooden door, they opened it up and the stench hit them. They went on the inside and there was this lady lying on the floor in her own mess, her own vomit, in the last stages of HIV. She said, don't come, don't, don't come. But they went down and they embraced her. He said, you see that woman serving the food? That's the woman that that cell reached. <laughs> the people of the community, when they saw her whole, they said, what happened to you? A little while later, we had a, a, a cell leaders Saturday. We decided to honor cell leaders who were doing something. We chose that little lady. I don't know her name. I've forgotten it. And that's the point of all of this. I may not, not know your name for what you have done, but he does. And we were going to give her a, an award. I don't know if any of you pastors remember that. And when we announced that she had won, wow, her face lit up. She came forward like she was the Queen of England. I am thankful to God for you. Our childcare team, our youth workers, our teachers in our schools, our mothers, our 400 plus mothers that are looking after the Watoto children every day, washing their clothes cooking their food, loving them. We've received so much criticism because we run an orphanage until you come and see. And you find out we don't run an orphanage, we run little homes and families. And those children don't see themselves any longer as disadvantaged, but specially advantaged because God is their father. And look what he did in my life. Little boys like Raymond, who sang here with a scarf around his neck. First time I really got to know Raymond was when I went out to, to what was called the Worship Academy, which my son James had started to train our Watoto children how to be worship leaders and write songs. And by the way, many of those songs that were there are written by us and by them. And Raymond was about to sing a song that he had written. And when he did sing it, I was blown away by the beauty of his voice. But Raymond started life in a garbage pile outside a hospital in Jinja in a plastic bag thrown away. And he lay there for a day until someone heard him crying. They took him to a baby's home in Jinja 
And then they heard about our baby's home and they brought him. And today, Raymond is a bright, shining star. I am thankful for you. Thousands and thousands of leaders. I want to thank my three precious biological children. <laughs> Timothy, Rachel, and James. They weren't called. I was. They bore the brunt of what it meant as young, impressionable children to see and experience the suffering and the cost of what it meant to live and work here in Uganda. And so many of us in this church are too young to really know. It was hard. They witnessed the war. They, they saw the dead bodies on the streets. They were tied up in our homes, in our home, as the thieves stole everything, threatened to kill us, tried to and couldn't. They endured the hardships of going away to boarding school when it was not part of their culture, away from mom and dad. You understand the cost. For that, Timothy, James, and Rachel, I say thank you. to the most amazing, faithful, loyal, dedicated wife and mother on the planet. And you honor her by calling her mama and me papa. Hey, you can't get rid of your mama and papa. <laughs> We're going on holiday. <laughs> you are talented and you are beautiful and you are hardworking. You're a model and an example of what a wife and a mother should be. I truly love and adore you and I thank God for who you are. We could not have done what we have done with the help of God without each other. <laughs> On the day of our marriage, we learned that we would be better together than we were alone. It's true. We learned that from my grandfather as he preached at that wedding, that two are better than one and that a threefold cord cannot be broken. And Marilyn, you and I and God are a tough team. Thank you for holding my hand, for walking by my side. You make me proud and you look good. And I'm not finished, I got one more good line. You are as stubborn <laughs> in a good way as Sheila, right, as Sheila. Sheila's your disciple. You are as stubborn in a good way as an ox, tenacious as a bulldog. And Levy, she is the true Marilyn, the mighty mouse of Marmara. <laughs> she 
grew up in a little town called Marmara, and our kids have been making names for all of us. You know, like Glorious Gary from Gananoque, Germany. The greatest joy, well, Jesus. It goes without saying, Jesus. But you know what? Our joy, our thanks is because of you. I can't look at you and not burst with pride. I love you. I'm proud of you. And then finally, this is where we're going now in this service. Our pastoral team. Just remain standing for just one moment. Just remain standing for one moment. Do you know that every one of these young people here are homegrown? Not one, I don't think, has been imported from anywhere. You got saved here, and that you can show us the seat got filled with the Holy Spirit, got called into, over there, got called into, you've all got a story. My greatest legacy will not be this church. It will be you. And you know that I believe in you, every one of you. And you all know that you are too young and too inexperienced to do what you're doing. And sometimes you even think you're too stupid. But you know what? God takes ordinary people to do extraordinary things, and that's us. And I love you, and I'm proud of you. And Watoto Church, I want you to know the future is bright because of what you have standing in front of you today. You may be seated. Oh, I got three minutes and two seconds. We have, I'm filled with joy and thanksgiving and compassion and I'm not gonna take long, but you know, every day when I drive through the city, my heart breaks, every day. I've never got used to it. I hope I never do. We're surrounded on these potholed streets on every side by people, men, women, children, whose lives are still tormented, broken, poor, desperately in need of a miracle. The miracle of God's love, His grace, and His salvation. And most of them will never hear it from this pulpit, but they can't hear it from you where you live. As Jesus wept for Jerusalem, I still weep for the city of Kampala. I'll never forget the day that I first came into Kampala and it was broken. You saw some of the pictures up there. There's some, it was broken. And I remember going and standing on Namirembe Hill and there was a, there was a clouds came in across the city as the storm began to brew. And I looked at this broken city and the sun came out and a rainbow sh went from one end of the city to the other. And I took it as a word from God that at the foot of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold called Kampala that God wants to unearth. But we're not there yet. Let's not give up. Let's never be satisfied with what we have. Because if we're satisfied with what we have, that's all we'll ever have. There is more, much more. There are greater days, better days, brighter days, bolder days. If God can do this till now, he can do even greater things. 
All he's doing is looking for a man or a woman who will say yes unreservedly. And you're here. I know you are. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you about one of those ordinary people who are heroes. Do you remember we had the Christmas cantata up here? And there was a sort of a mini mountain made out of rocks. And it had to move out of the way in the middle of the, uh, of the, uh, the presentation. They put a young man underneath that pile of rocks. And his sole job was to move the mountain. I, I tell you, that's dedication. That's servant. And nobody knows his name. Nobody. He did it. Why? Because he loves Jesus and what Jesus has done in his life. You understand that. You've seen it. Finally, I have hope. I have hope because Jesus will not abandon us. He will not abandon you. He will never forsake you. He said, I, he said, I am surely with you to the end of the age. And his presence gives us hope. He said it today. We are confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until the completion, until the day of Jesus Christ. God has not finished with us yet. There is more. And our goal, it's, it's, it's not very big. Let's just change the world. And let's just start with our part of the world. And I know I'm over time, but this is my, <laughs> the last time, so. I, lo I love, I love, I've been reading it. The story of how the church came to Uganda. The end of the 18, middle of the 1800s, an explorer by the name of Stanley, looking for David Livingston, came through and he, he ended up at Rubaga, the palace of the king. He was so impressed by the Buganda kingdom and the organization and many things about it that he wrote a letter to the newspaper in the, in the United Kingdom. And the newspaper said, talked about this kingdom and said, you need to send missionaries. He gave the letter to a soldier who went back through Sudan on the way he was killed. His body rotted in the desert and they found him with the letter tucked in his boot. They took it out and it finally got to the newspaper and was published and within one week, there were, there were so many candidates who were willing to go to the middle of what was then the dark, unknown continent of Africa to respond and take the gospel. They had to weed it down to nine men, only men. The last of the men on the day that they left spoke to the crowd that had gathered and said, you'll probably hear within a year that most likely one or more of us will be dead. Is it likely that we will, any of us will survive? His name was Alexander McKay. Within two years, eight of the nine were dead. Some of them killed on the southern side of the lake in a, host in a hostile activity. Others from malaria and from dysentery and had to go back. But Alexander McKay stayed. He wasn't a preacher. He was a, a builder. And he taught how to make bricks. And the king loved him because he was such a handy man. And he struggled and he toiled for many years. They carried with them all the way from Zanzibar the Bible. And they began to just read the Bible. And the story of the Ugandan church became the most told story, and the most exciting story of missions at the end of the 18th, 1800s as one by one and then in droves, the people of Baganda, Baganda began to receive Christ. And it came at great cost as the kings juggled between the 
Muslims and the Catholics and the Protestants, and there's war in your history all about that. And the young page boys that the king held as his favorites one day denied him, so he took them to the swamp down at Namu something. <laughs> they chopped off their arms and their legs, they tied them to the fire and they burned them to death. We, we all know it's a, it's a massive story. The Church of England sent their first bishop and the king sent the message to Ginger because he came through the back door and he was killed, never got here. He only saw it in the distance. So they sent another bishop and he died on the southern side of the lake, Bishop Parker. It was only the third who finally made it here, Bishop Tucker. It's an amazing story of men who gave themselves without reservation to build the kingdom of God at any cost. And let me tell you something, that's what it takes. Uganda was steeped in witchcraft. Everything had witchcraft. Shrines everywhere. Human sacrifice was a way of life. Babies were sacrificed regularly. At any royal occasion, the royal soldiers would go out and simply grab the first 200, 300, 500 people, bring them back, and they would be slaughtered. I'm not telling you something that is not history. But in 1908, one of the, the person voted the most influential British person to have ever lived. His name was Winston Churchill, made a visit to Uganda, and he wrote a little book, it's in my library, and he said, concentrate on Uganda. Concentrate on Uganda. Uganda is the pearl of Africa. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Because this nation was transformed by the power of the presence of Christ through the church and the power of his word. I don't know if you study that history. Good. Well, you know better than I, and I've said some of it wrong. Forgive me. When Marilyn and I came to Uganda 40 years ago, we did not come to the Pearl of Africa. In fact, it was called the Bloody Pearl. A million people had been killed in civil war. We reverted back to a high level of insanity. Bishop, Archbishop Janani Luwum, it cost him his life. The general superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of God, the organization that we belong to, lost its life. The very first church I went to in Uganda was in the foothills of Kumi. I went to the little church. They said, we're going to worship in the hills. Not This is where we used to worship when there was a certain president in Uganda who was fighting the church. So we would meet in the hills. And that was my first worship service. A lot like this without all the... It was alive. I never forgot it. And they said we would meet in the hills because when we saw the soldiers, we would then be able to scatter. That's where the country had come. Can I tell you that 40 years later, we are living in a transformed Uganda. And this has nothing to do with politics, and I want to stay away from it as far as it's not just us, it's not just the church. It's all God's people in all their different places, and God can take ungodly kings and do godly things. I have hope. I want, I, want, I want to finish by saying this. In a world that is going ever more insane. 
And I won't begin a list of the idiotic, stupid, unbelievably ignorant things that supposedly educated people believe and are practicing around the world and want to shove it down our throats. Uganda, the next generation, rise up and say, no, Africa belongs to Jesus. Africa belongs to Jesus. You can get excited, but it's going to cost you. <laughs> and so it is with great joy that I stand before you and say, I have run my race. I have finished my course. You may be seated. And I'm supposed to be finished, but there was this, 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 this one thing. I used to, I used to love Phil Kagi. You don't even know who he is because I'm that old and you're that young. But he was one of the world's greatest guitar players, Phil Kagi. And he, and he, and he sang a hymn that burned into my soul as a young person. And I'd like to sing it, but I don't play the guitar anymore. And, but these are the words. And I say it to you, Julius. I say it to all of you. Rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God, his kingdom tarries long. As faithful workmen watch and pray the light and light the night of wrong. Rise up, O man of God. The church for you doth wait. Your strength unequal to the task, but Christ in you is great. Lift high the cross of Christ. Tread where his feet have trod as brothers of the Son of Man. Rise up, O men of God. I'm honored to have one of God's great generals with us today, Bob Hoskins. He's gonna preach here on Sunday. Don't tell anybody because there's not enough room. This, this year will be his 80th year of preaching the gospel. And, and I, I, would, I would love it if you would pray for me through him.
such an honor to be out in Uganda on an occasion such as this. It's a monumental moment in the kingdom of God. And the humility with which Gary and Marilyn talk about the work. I have been in ministry, as Gary said, for this year I am in my 80th year of ministry. And my, my knees gave out a few years ago, but I still have 120 over 80 heart rate and a, and a heart, my heart rate is down in the upper 40s. So it's a strong heart and weak legs. But in these 80 years, I have traveled through every country of the world and I've seen every kind of missionary activity that exists. And I'm here to say that for me, I have never seen a finer piece of work than what has happened right here in Uganda. There are many who talk about holistic work, but it very seldom happens. Either there is all emphasis on the spiritual and the church and the building, and very little done for the community. And then there's the other side that comes in and ministers to the community, but never leads one soul to Christ. But what God has done here in this country through these beautiful people is a totally holistic, as Gary says, it is a ministry of transformation, and to God be all the glory. To God be all the glory. And there is the greatest thing that you can say about any leader is that he has those who take the mantle and run with the message that he has implanted in their hearts. And setting before us is the example of those people that God has used you, Gary and Marilyn, to train into leadership. And so I, I, I don't know if I have the right to do this, but I'm 87, and so I can do, I think, about anything I want. So I want all of this pastoral staff that stood, I want you to come to this platform, and I'm going to lay my hands on Gary and Marilyn, but I want you to surround them. I want this whole pastoral staff to come and surround them. Now, he may talk about retirement, but Winston Churchill said during the middle of the war, when the first victories were won, that this is not the end of the war. He said, it's not even the end of the beginning, but it is the beginning of the end. So you, you have reached a place, you have, you have ended one phase, but it's just the beginning of what God has for you. Uh, you have lots of years and lots of God is going to use you in ways that you've never dreamed in the future. So don't talk anymore about retirement. Talk about what God is going to do in the future. Will you, friends, come forward and just let us lay our hands together? Father, we lay our hands on these choice servants that you called specifically many years ago, and you brought them to one of the most difficult places in all of the world with a passion and a vision to see your kingdom built and in these 40 years, through many dangers, toils, and snares, and tests, and trials, you have given them the anointing of your Holy Spirit. You have given them perception and insights beyond all human reason and understanding. You have given them visions and dreams that have only been born out of the Holy Spirit. And for that, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And now we ask, Lord, as they begin a new phase of life, that your hand will continue to rest upon them, that you will continue to give them the gifts of discernment and ears to hear what the Spirit has to say for their lives and their ministry and their talents as they move into the future and that you will open doors that they never dreamed would open, and you will take them into areas that they never expected they would reach, and you will 
give them an expanded outreach even as they move forward into the future years. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory for the great testimonies that will be forthcoming in coming months and years of how God is using Gary and Marilyn in new and wondrous ways to to build your kingdom, to glorify your name, to exalt Jesus above everything else. And we will then, as now, give you all the praise and all the glory. And I pray for this staff that stands behind us, Lord. These beautiful people that you have used, Gary and Marilyn, to lead and to train and to raise up. And now they are taking the mantle and they are moving forward into the future. And what you are going to do in Uganda in the future will surpass everything that we have witnessed and testified to today. And again, all the praise and all the glory will go to that only worthy name, the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we hear a great big hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you. to bow before your name. Amen. Break the chains that bind us. Bring the word of life onto this land. Let our country
He remains the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is awesome. Wow. If you can allow us a few minutes to just share some things from our hearts. It won't be long. But please just let us do that if you may. Thank you all for coming. It's very exciting to see each one of you here tonight. This is a really, really momentous occasion. And it's one we will live to remember for the rest of our lives. Our hearts are overflowing with gratitude. And pastors Gary and Marilyn, thank you. You have been true spiritual father and mother to us. We are what we are today, greatly because of your input, your love. You have mentored us. You have loved us. You have been patient with us. You have believed in us even when we didn't see why. You have taken a chance on us. And you allowed us to be part of your lives. And we thank you for that. You. I'll always cherish the times when we spend time together. You talking to us as mom and dad and teaching us this and that very valuable things, imparting wisdom on us, I will always cherish those moments. Mom, I will always cherish those moments. You clothed me, you gave me nice clothes, you gave me nice shoes. I praise God that we're the same shoe size and dress size. How cool is that? And uh, you taught me how to be a good pastor's wife. You taught me, you taught me how to be a good steward of what God has entrusted to me. You have both, both modeled excellence, humility, and Pastor Gary, I said this to you and I will always say it. One of the things I truly admire about you is your courage. And when I grow up, I want to be like you. <laughs> Mom, you're a woman of true faith, bold, daring faith. And I pray that God will teach me to be the same. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for walking with us. And uh, I take comfort in the knowledge that even though you have handed over leadership to us, we're still walking this journey together. Yep. And thank you for that. Yep. To our dear pastoral team, you guys are precious. We could never do what we do without each one of you. We cherish you. And I want to say thank you to each one of you. You're real brothers, you're real sisters, we are colleagues, we are family, and we are in this together for the long haul. And with Christ leading us, we are going to do and experience mighty exploits for his kingdom. For every one of you who's come today, it's an honor to have you with us tonight. We don't take it for granted that you set aside the time and came to be with us. And we thank you because we know you believe in Watoto. You believe in the work and ministry of Watoto and you're a great support to us. And we also know that you love us. And guys, we cherish your support. We covet your prayers. Please do not quit on Watoto, but continue to be right there walking with us because we are better together. And I just want to assure you, like it was said earlier, Christ in us is great. 
So we are going to serve you. We are going to be there and do everything God has called us to do by his grace. Amen. 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 To our lovely family, our parents, thank you so much for loving us and taking care of us and being such great cheerleaders and just walking this journey with us and letting us be who God has called us to be. Thank you so much, our parents. And uh, our siblings, we cherish you. We know you're not just siblings, but your dear friends, great support system. And we thank you for that. Um, our children, our four lovely children, whom God has given us, we love you so much. We are so proud of you. You're our gift from God. And we thank you because you're such a great support and you believe in us. We're doing this together. And we're excited for all the things that God has ahead for us. My dear husband, thank you for honoring me above all women. Thank you for being a loving and faithful husband, for being wonderful to me. Thank you. And my confidence when it comes to my husband is the fact that he loves the Lord. He's totally dependent on the Lord. So trust the Jesus in him because he will lead him to lead us. I want to assure you that I will walk this journey with you. I will love you. I will support you. I will hold your hand. And for as long as I have breath, I will be by your side. And finally, and most importantly, yep. Yep. this church was started about 39 years ago. Pastors Gary and Marilyn responded to the call of God. And God has built the church this far. The foundation of this church is none other than Jesus Christ. And I want to assure you that he continues to be the God and the foundation of this church. Amen. And this is my confidence that he who started this amazing work 39 years ago, he is faithful to sustain it and to bring it to its intended purpose. All for the glory of God. Amen. I can't agree anymore with what Vanita has just shared. It's absolutely true, and I want to thank you, uh, Pastors Gary and Marilyn, for loving us, with your entire family, actually. I just want to thank you so, so much. Um, the last time uh, Pastor Gary's mom was in the country, uh, Gary and Marilyn were out of the country, and Vanita and I went uh, to visit with Jaja Doris. And... We took some dessert and sat with her and she held her hands and she said, I am so grateful for the children God has blessed me with. That's what she said. Every single one of them, God has used them. And then she said to us particularly, forward Toto, she said, Julia's son, Vanita, 
When I see what God has done through Gary and Marilyn, she looked at us again and said, who ever knew? And, and then she said, I am just so thankful for the privilege that God has given me to be Gary's mom. We held hands and prayed. And then she said, God, what you have done at Watoto is nothing short of a miracle. Gary and Marilyn have shared some stories, but there are many stories. Here's some good news. They are writing a book. And Watoto Church, we are going to see those stories. There's many books that are going to come. And they're writing that book right now. Now, I guess what's going on in everybody's mind is, now what? That's the booklet we give to everybody that says yes to Jesus. Now what? Watoto, let's write some more stories. Let's write some more stories. I've thought long and hard about now what? I've come to two conclusions. There are parts of the story of our future that I don't know. There's parts that I know. For the parts that I don't know, that we don't know, we're going to take a posture of humility and say, God, whatever you want to do, do it, Lord. You see, friends, the things that God has in store for us, some of those no eye has seen, no ear has heard, not even ideas getting into our minds, but God reveals it to us by His Spirit. We are going to be people of prayer because that's how we get to know the mind of God. He says, He's the God of all the earth. Jeremiah 33, uh, chapter 33 and verse 3. He says, Call to me and I will answer you. I will show you those very things. They are great and mighty things. Things you have no idea about. I want to live for such things. So we're going to be a people of prayer. We won't stop. And for those are for the parts we don't know. But for the parts that we know, and maybe in three minutes I'll share some of those. Our identity is never going to change. We do many things as we're total, but we are a church. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are, and when I say church, it's not the building. We are a family. That's who we are. That's not going to change. And it's a global family. We are family that worships here at Watoto. We are family that worships all around the world. But I've chosen to say we will join you in celebrating Christ and also caring for community. That's Watoto family. Bigger than those who come to Watoto Church. That's our identity. We have our DNA that's captured in our values. That's not going to change. That one I know for certain. Jesus will always be the center of everything we do. It will never be about Julius and Vanita or any of us. It is always going to be about Jesus. We choose mom to operate with faith-based boldness. You've taught us that. We are going to relentlessly pursue excellence in everything we do. We do recognize the culture around us settles for average, but we are going to be countercultural. We will pursue excellence with 
everything. When it comes to God's word, we are going to be Bible preaching, Bible believing, and Bible living. That's who we're going to be. Let me end with the part of vision because we've always been vision led. Our vision is not going to stagnate. We are going to continue growing and multiplying. That is for our small groups, the cells, but it is going to be for our campuses as well. Wherever God opens a door in a city, we will be there. We're going to do that. We're going to grow and multiply when it comes to the people that come to Watoto. But it's more than the numbers. Our goal and our desire is that every single one of you will become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. So it's not numbers, it's disciples. That's what we are committed to saying. We believe every single human being has God-given potential. As Watoro Church, we will do everything with the pastors. We will design the things around us to help you live to your fullest potential. We're going to do that. We look at you not just as you are, but as a leader. Because as Watoro, we're committed to raising leaders. Raising leaders who are transformational. And we're going to continue to do that. There's another part. We will continue to grow and multiply a heart of compassion for the broken communities. We're going to love anybody that society thinks they don't deserve to be loved. Whenever a little boy or girl is abandoned in a hospital, we're going to say, yes, give them to us because we love them. Whenever there is an orphan child who needs a home, we are going to rescue them. Whenever there is a cry of a vulnerable woman who's saying, oh God, does anybody care? We are going to be the church that goes with Jesus' heart towards them, to restore dignity to them. Our heart of love for the broken will continue to grow. It will not stop. It will not. And there's a scripture as I end. In Acts 17. It says, from one man, God made the nations of the earth. So that they could inhabit people. They could inhabit the whole earth. And then he did something. He marked out the boundaries and appointed their times in history. I have a shared conviction with Pastor Gary and Marilyn. We do. This is Africa's appointed time. I believe that. Yes, we have our fair share of chronic challenges, you know all of them, the corruption, the leadership issues, the poverty, the disease. We also have issues in the church, unfortunately, which are similar to those. But we have hope. And this is our hope. There is a redeemer. There is a redeemer. His name is Jesus. He can turn what we have lost into a beautiful story. I believe it with everything inside of me. Everything inside of me. If we lift up the cross above every other thing here in our continent, Africa, we will rise and be everything that God has called us to be. No longer will our young potential be taken as cheap labor to the Middle East. That is beautiful potential. We are going to harness that potential here with everything. We just finished a report that our friends One Hope did. That is our young people. And here's what they said. 
I don't think anybody understands the youth today. And they're going through struggles. They have mental health issues. They are suicidal. They are asking questions about their gender identity. It's massive. They're doing drugs. This is under our nose in our schools. But as Watoro Church, we're going to reach those young people. Because that's the future of our country. The true state of the nation report is not what we hear. It is the state of our youth. That's the true state. Who will respond to the cry of our young people and children? We're going to do it. We're going to reach our young people with everything we've got. I could go on and on, but I want to invite you. What God has done through Gary and Marilyn, here's what I desire with your new jacket. Just like Elisha, I am craving for double triple quadruple whatever he's done for you we are believing for more we are believing for more we are believing for more and Watoro Church it's time to pioneer again in the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus name if you believe it come on let's start let's declare it it's a new day it's a new day for Africa. We will see his goodness. Holy Spirit, we depend on you. Jesus, our eyes are fixed on you. And God, our Heavenly Father, you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or even imagine. Do it, Lord, in our day. Do it, Lord, in our generation. Write some more stories of your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Your voice resounds through the
right now Jesus we raise our hands tonight as an act of surrender and we want to go not in our own strength we want to go in the power of the Holy Spirit because you are the one who is with us and you are here to empower us as we leave this place tonight to go to the broken to the, the hurting because it's to such Jesus that you came and you're calling us too respond so we lift our hands to you tonight and we're saying here we are empower us feel us for the journey that is ahead in jesus name i do pray and everybody say the big amen amen and amen and amen what a wonderful moment come on one more time can we celebrate jesus tonight let's celebrate him what a wonderful moment and we are about to end and uh, don't sit down because we're going to sing some, you know, we're going to dance a little bit, you know, as we go to the broken, to the cities, to your homes and everywhere. But, you know, we have a culture, one of our core values here at Watopla is generosity. And we want to give you an opportunity to express your generosity to God. And so there are going to be baskets in the exits, outside in the overflow, yeah. And so let's give generously. Let's say, God, thank you so much for what you've done for me. 
and I'm giving you a thanksgiving offering for what you have done. So give whatever you can, again, for the purpose of reaching the broken and the hurting. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we say at Watoro, it's time for us to give. Now, as we give, feel free to exit at your convenience. But also, if you want to dance a little bit, come on, stay here and let's sweat a little bit. The future is bright and there is more that God has for us. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you.
Oh,